want to say a few words, and here's the man that came up with the idea. <laughs> well, last year, um, just as a little background, uh, Lon was standing in the parking lot. I think you had a, a, a demo to do, and you were a little hesitant about what the, pop, what the general population would think. And so, anyhow, you did your demo, and we came up with this idea that not everybody, you know, people people really think that um, landscape, the plein air painting is a very sort of traditional style, sort of in the Hudson River School and lawn, and these folks here, with the exception of Cynthia down there, are artists who are really, we came up with this theme of pushing the boundaries. So they're sort of trying to move beyond what we think of, what the general population thinks of as, as plein air painting. Uh, so, Lon came up with this idea last year that we should gather together artists and have a dialogue. And really, and, and then that, that coupled with the fact that the awards last year were given to Lon, Patrick, Kyle, um, and, and the public came in and <laughs> they were sort of stupefied as to why those people had received the awards because they were sort of more abstract, they were looked, you know, very different subject matter than what most people expected to see, rivers and mountains. So we decided it would be a great opportunity, not only to educate, well, for myself, to educate myself, but to also educate the public on what some contemporary plein air painters are trying to do these days. So, with with the long sort of inspiration, the reaction of the public, we came up with this idea to do a panel discussion with sort of traditional painters and non-traditional painters. And then Larry Moore uh, agreed, thank God, to moderate, because otherwise I was going to be sitting there and that would have been a challenge. <laughs> so anyhow, with that, I'll um, turn it over to you, Larry, and thank you. take it away. Uh, thanks for coming. It's going to be fun. So I am the moderator, and that means I don't say anything other than ask questions. And um, this is the a, a big panel, so we're going to uh, get a lot of important information that's going to come out of this. I will say to each of you that um, try and keep your responses short. Uh, no fighting. Uh, uh, no spitting. So um, uh, if, if you start sort of going on and on, I'm going to give you a look. It's going to be like this. <laughs> you know, I may snap my finger or something like that, so uh, don't get mad. So uh, first, what, what we're going to do is, I'm just curious, how many artists do we have in this, in, in the audience? Okay, so we have a few. And then uh, uh, the rest are artisans or, or art enthusiasts, that sort of thing. Okay, good. So we're going to talk uh, a little bit about, we're going to start with sort of basic concepts of plein air. This is a plein air event, so we're going to talk a little that, and then we're going to get into which is the stuff that I find fascinating, which is artistic intent, and it's going to vary from person to person, so we're going to get a pretty broad spectrum. So my job is to ask questions, and we're going to start at this end with Lon. Oh, real quick. All right, so when we, when we, I'm going to ask a question, we're going to go from person to person. Please introduce yourself uh, when, you, when you get the, when it's your turn. So we start with Lon, and uh, I'm going to ask this first question. Why paint outside at all? Okay, well, I'm Lon Brower uh, from uh, St. Louis area, where we're in Illinois, I think in Grand City, but uh, uh, some St. Louis area. Uh, uh, answer to the question, why paint it all, uh, outside? Uh, it's, it's, it's direct observation. Uh, what we're doing is, is it, it's just, yeah, outside is, is uh, uh, it's a direct observation, I think. The fact that we've got something in front of us that we can use that we can utilize. <laughs> In those terms, then you know whether you paint outside or paint inside, working from still life or working from life, there's, there's something, there's a whole lot of things you can gain color wise and, and, and just in terms of structure. Like, you know, uh, outside, so it's, it's great to be outside. Um, okay. My name is Andrash Valati, Andy Valley, if I call him Andy, and I am, um, I Started, I did not paint plein air. I went through college and I painted all from photographs. Didn't ever use um, any outdoor painting. And then I, I went to this post, I went to this course, and there was this old English painter 
and he was like, man, what are you doing? He's like, your, your pains are terrible. They're not even like, <laughs> they're, they're not even not even ready to call them pains. Forget whether they're good or bad pains. Because you need to start paying from observation. You know, break your palette down. I didn't add all the colors in the rainbow. So he said, primary colors, get outside, observe, and paint. And, um, and that's what I did. And I was just like kind of shocked at how difficult it was at first. But also, I could feel uh, real growth. And, um, and then I just, got hooked on it and I slowly would paint plein air but I also would take things small studies outdoors taking my studio to make larger and I just found that to be a great way to work develop your own sense of color your own composition because you're you're the camera's not deciding or, or anything else it's you're deciding what is going to go into it. So. Um, I'm Beth Bays and I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania and um, I was a graphic designer for 30 years, and uh, I've just been painting for about 10. And when I first started painting, I was really painting inside. I was doing a lot of figurative work, still lifes, and, uh, and then I moved to Pennsylvania and uh, joined the plein air group outside. And I, I think it opened up a whole new world. I mean, there's something about um, painting outside. It's first of all, what instead of just you know copying a photograph to, to me, which is copying, it's more like what is it out there that excites you? You know, you're driving, all of a sudden there's light or something going on. It, it's what it's a, it's a story that kind of unfolds before you. And then with plein air, because your light is totally changing, it's like you have to quickly think and and you know, make adjustments. And um, I think the freshness of it. The plein air painting, I think, originally started as you know studies for people outside. And uh, I, I just think it, it leaves a freshness that a, a, a photo just doesn't. And then there's the whole thing about being outside and the whole experience of like who you see, who you meet, you see a bear, you know, it's 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 all of that. For example. For example. <laughs> so that's that's what it is for me. It's the whole experience. All right, I'm Kyle Buckland um, from Abingdon, Virginia, and I started painting when I was a teenager. I, I fell in love with uh, the impressionists, the French impressionists, particularly Monet, and and um, I. You know, I was reading about them and saw that they were going outside and painting, and I knew that that was something that I was interested in. Um, I think it's about the experience, and you know, Beth said that there's, it's, it's telling a story, and I think that uh, I wanted to to tell this the story that they were telling. Um, and I think as we work into this storytelling, we we find out that it's it's our job to tell you know the story in a in a fresh new way. But but you want to tell. You, know, you got to figure out what story it is that you're telling. So, the the experience is what means a lot to me. I work in the studio some too, but I, I'm always bringing things from outside when I'm in the studio. I'm thinking about how uh, the experience took place out there. And when you're out there and you're in the moment, or you know, as we talk about being in the creative zone, um, you're responding. I mean, it, it, you're 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 feeling things, you're feeling the breeze, you're hearing the sounds around you, and um, ultimately I think what we're doing, we're not just painting what we're seeing, but we're painting a moment of, in time, and we're painting the, the experience, and I think it's hard to distill that from just a, a photograph. Uh, so that's that's why I paint outside. My name's Patrick Lee. Um, I think, uh, I'm from, I'm from uh, Pittsburgh, PA, first of all, and uh, I think, uh, Painting outside is important. Or painting from life is important because uh, it puts you in a it puts you in a mode where you you have to think on your feet. You have to think about drawing, color, design, all that stuff. And sometimes it doesn't succeed. But I think what you get from that is there's something that goes on inside you in your mind and your subconscious that becomes a part of you that you can take into the studio, um, or work on other studio paintings or finished paintings. Um, I don't really consider my planner paintings finished paintings, like finished statements. They're kind of like uh, just observations, studies of color, shape. Sometimes the drawing's messed up, but I want to capture the color notes. Um, and there's really no other way. I think as um, Neil Ruby said, you know, the best way to learn drawing, uh, color, shape, design, all that stuff is to paint outside. It's so neat. Um, and for me, that's what excites me about it. In addition to all the other stuff these guys said, I mean, they pretty much covered it with that. But for me, it's the mode, it's the, it's the mind you're, it's the mode your mind gets put in when you're doing it. Excellent. All right, why is it?
Good morning. Uh, my name is Doug Clark, and uh, I've been clean air painting for a little bit. And uh, my first experience was going to uh, a local clean air event and uh, had a lot of fun. And then I went to one of the East of Quick Draws, and I was just amazed at what all of the artists could put out in just two hours. It was just floored. And I've never seen anything like it. Uh, for me, uh, my brief experience was, you know, painting for, you know, three, four hours, uh, and then to see what they could do in two hours was far beyond anything I could do. And it just drove me to saying, well, this is something that I really enjoy. And, and the other thing I have to say is that uh, for me, there's nothing more of a rush than just getting in the car and just driving or walking around and observing and just looking and you know, just searching and that, how would you say, that unexpected find uh, for, the, for the reference of the people that I have just brought in. I just drove around and, you know, saw this church steeple in front of the architecture and I said, okay, this is kind of interesting. But then I drove around the back and these guys were roofing and I saw all these rooftops. And oh, can you speak up just a little bit? Okay, yeah. Especially with that. Yeah, with, um, sorry. Uh, when I drove around the church and I saw all the roofers and I saw all the angles of the different rooftops and the telephone wires and everything, I said, this is it. This is the story. I mean, it's just something of a narrative for me. Um, these aren't, like Patrick said, a complete painting. This is just really just capturing a narrative. You are in the moment. You know, this is it. And, you know, it's a fleeting moment. You're chasing light. You're chasing color. Uh, it's very exhilarating. Uh, you have gnats flying in your face. You have <laughs> rain. Uh, you have all kinds of elements, and but those, you know, they they are feeding you information as you are painting, and that direct uh, intake and reaction. Uh, and sometimes, when you're painting, it's by the seat of your pants. I mean, it's like with these quick draws, or like the other night with the nocturnes. Uh, you know, the store's gonna. The, uh, was it the restaurant's going to turn off at nine? You know, <laughs> I'm painting the inside from the outside. And I've got you know, looking at the time. It, it's a rush for for me. It's fun. Uh, I wouldn't do it if it wasn't fun, but it is very challenging. Uh, and I think that's why I paint. So, um, my name is Elena Beth. Uh, and um, my funny accent is from Ukraine. Just get that. <laughs> but uh, I live right now in Maine. I'm actually coming from very, very traditional background. So, and to give you an idea, I would spend between three to six months on one drawing or one painting. Every day, almost every day. I have to do some other stuff at times. But um, a few years back, I moved to Maine. And guess what? Maine is beautiful, right? And I like others. Here I am, stuck inside. Well, I decided to do an event because someone said, well, just go, do it, why not? I did not paint landscapes at all. I did not paint, paint plein air. All I did, I spent a lot of time in the studio, painting from life, granted. I really don't like painting from photos, what everyone said, because it's really lucky and immediate response. It's, well, why repeat something that already been done? Find your own way, will you? So that's kind of how I look about and think about painting from photos. I mean, sure, we probably all use them, but anyway, let's go back to plein air. So I went and did the event. And actually, it was Beth Bass that I met right there. <laughs> She's responsible for it. And we had a great time. Oh my god, I had a great time. First time ever. I didn't have to spend hours and hours and hours. Actually, I was required to respond, put it down, and see what happened. Luckily, I had the drawing skills that allowed me to do it and I knew a little bit about color and I realized it's a lot of fun and it's so invigorating and responding to the scene right there it's so interesting you know and being not in the studio in front of the same thing where nothing changes although granted I do love painting people so they always have a mood they get up they breathe they change and I'm finding that the light does the same so it's greatly interesting and since then, I've pretty much been painting landscapes, although in the winter I do figures and portraits. So that's my little story. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, my name's Ed Hatch. I live in Prince George, Virginia. And what I like about painting outdoors is you need to make decisions quickly. Uh, try to find a design, leave things out. Um, but uh, what I like the most, I think, is that you cannot capture with the photograph is temperature shifts out there in the landscape. Very subtle. I picks it up, obviously, but the camera does not. And, you know, broad shots and things like that. So that's, that's what I really uh, kind of concentrate on now is, is identifying color shifts and, of course, uh, uh, the design properties that seem to come and go with the play of light. It makes it difficult but intriguing. And it's also, um, uh, it's an exercise that's <laughs> sometimes futile. But uh, it's, it's, every time I go out there, I try to learn something, even though I have to scrape it off. So that's temperature shifts, I'd say, is the most fun for me. I'm Carol Gable, um, originally from North Dakota, and I live up in the Hudson Valley. So probably the tradition part comes in from, I, I grew up watching my grandpa paint. He was a, a rancher, and in the winter, he sent away for a famous artist horse and did this through the mail. So I grew up watching him paint and wanting to paint, and I wanted to be a wildlife and western painter. So I was self-taught copying photos. And I can paint very photorealistically by copying photos, but there was something missing. And when I entered my first plein air event, for the heck of it, a little art center auction, I really sucked. <laughs> it was bad because it just, there was so much to edit, and, and if you look at my work, I'm probably still not very good at editing because I do try to capture, I try to make it about the light. And I'm all about trying to get out there as early as I can because for me that's when the magic happens. And for me, there's a sense of um, serenity and it's just an emotional response to that. As you probably saw it on the crutches again. And I've had my share of problems and for me painting, there's something very healing or something in your brain happens that takes you uh, away from that. It just shuts everything else out for a while because you're so focused on what you're doing. I can understand why they use art for therapy. And for me, if I could just keep going all the time and not stop, I'd probably feel a lot better most of the time. <laughs> but anyway, so it, it's been my passion. Um, it, it, I probably, like I said, I'm, I'm not trying so hard to be traditional. I just do what I do. I, I don't have formal training to really know any different. I try to pick up things and learn from the people around me that, that I see and, uh, and I admire. I'm um, Cynthia Rosen. I'm from Vermont. It's sort of funny that I'm next to Terrell because as opposed to serenity, I go outside for the activity, for the inspiration. 95% um, of the time it's great. This morning I sat there Lucky I had cell phone reception because I was waiting for the sun to come out. I knew what I wanted to paint. The sun wasn't there. The scene wasn't going to work without the sun. And we have a deadline here. <laughs> Normally, you know, at home I just go a different day. But, um, yeah, for me it's inspiration. It has to do with the movement of time and the activity of being outside. And uh, I'd rather be outside than I'm Neil Hughes uh, from New Jersey. <laughs> I uh, started my career as an illustrator and, uh, you know, working photos, and that was about problem solving mostly and solving other people's problems, really. But I got into that because I liked to paint, and I figured that was a way I could make money painting. And uh, at some point, I started making the transition into fine art. and. Uh, taking trips up to Maine and this kind of thing. And I just really fell in love with, you know, painting on the scene, you know. I mean, it's just a totally different experience. Like, when you look at, um, you know, rocks or trees or whatever, you see all these colors in there that you don't see, you know, if you're just doing it from a photograph. And um, I feel very blessed to be, you know, standing, uh, you know, before the ocean or at Mystic Seaport and smelling the, the steam engine, you know, from the boats up there or all these different experiences like being down here and uh, getting to swat all those stink bugs, you know, <laughs> just, uh, just so much uh, more to it. And now, to me, the experience is sort of more important than the actual, you know, 
work that you have. It's like, it's just so much fun. I just feel so alive. And, um, you know, these events, uh, you do have deadlines, and so there's pressure. So, like, I'm painting all day and, like, you know, really trying to paint quickly. And sometimes I paint better when I'm when I paint quick and I'm not thinking about it. I'm just you know like I got to get that down kind of thing uh, because I tend to think a little too much a lot of times. Uh, and um, like uh, when I was doing illustration, you know, I was always interested in the design and you know very formal compositions. Um, I, I was lucky. I went to the Philadelphia College of Art, and at that time. Um, the painting departments were just kind of, you know, anything goes, do your thing kind of stuff. But I was in the illustration department, so we had to really learn how to draw. We had anatomy, we had all these uh, courses that really taught you how to paint because you had to come out and compete with illustrators who were doing it for 20 years and that thing. So, um, all in all, it's like I feel like my life is just going in this direction and I just I feel like I'm a better painter now than I was before I started doing uh, like these clean air events and um, just like just so much fun and um, I can't wait to get up every day and just you know run out and start painting again you know it's just it's just um, just a really great experience to, to be able to do that and to meet all the, these wonderful people uh, the, the people that come to see the art are wonderful. All my buddies here that I paint with all the time, um, they're not making fun of me and stuff, they're, they're okay. You know? <laughs> uh, we've all formed a lot of very uh, close relationships. Um, I've been doing this for maybe eight years now, and uh, it's just wonderful. Anyway. Awesome. Oh, Thank you. Larry's giving me the. Uh, yeah. No, that was no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'll know. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you all. Great answers. Um, my favorite thing is um, you go into an event, you go into a museum, you go into a plein air event, and there are certain artists who you just recognize. You know, you you recognize their style. You don't have to look at the name. You know who they are. And so you identify them by certain aspects of their expression, right? So this is a really, a one. this is probably my favorite question, I think, on this, on this question. But from the artist standpoint, I would like to know what, their, what they think they are bringing to the expression of place or, you know, and we're plein air, so we're painting places and stuff. But, what are you as individuals? What are you after? What is what what is what are you bringing to expression? Of this? Does that make sense as a question? Okay, one. Yeah. Uh, the thing that I when I when I come to a painting, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll see. Well, when I I'm not really subject here. Some people are, and I'm not. Uh, uh, you know, like today, this morning, I painted a, a, a barn and silo, and, and I was driven to that. I saw that, but it was a white barn and a white silo against a white sky with, with fog. So uh, I thought, okay, this is an interesting problem. So as soon as I got past the subject, uh, I thought, you know, how do I, how do I construct this painting? How do I, this is, this is a problem. I, I'm, you know, I'm going to have a problem that I'm going to be in this mess, and I've got to figure out how to get out of it. And that, to me, is what's exciting about it. And uh, so what I will do then is I look at, I, you know, I draw on, on a lot of the experiences of people that I've looked at in the past. I was, I was in school in the 70s, late 70s, so uh, most of the people that were uh, uh, instructors uh, were abstract expressionists. You know, de Kooning was still painting, and, uh, and, and Rauschenberg, and all those men, and all those did. But, uh, but, you know, those guys, uh, you know, that is really in my soul because uh, I knew nothing about that stuff. And, and quite honestly, until really recently, I didn't understand how much of how much of an influence that had. So when I get in there and I see this barn, I want to construct that, in, in, in I want to have a, a strong, strong drawing. And once the drawing is there, I can distort and I can hang paint all day long. And that means I use all kinds of tools and I can throw paint. You know, I can I put it on thick, I can put it on thin, I can scrape through it, I can scrape it off, I can build it on again. I don't know where the painting's going to go. Uh, it's still based on the this 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 original concept that I want to show this barn. However, if that barn turns into a cow, 
I'm okay with that. <laughs> but if it but if it goes in that direction, I, what I try to do, my 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 uh, driving force is, I want the uh, the painting to drive the activity. And what I mean by that is, if if I as an artist try to make that barn look like that barn. Uh, it will look like that barn. I can do that, but it will be a dead, dead painting that I won't care about, and if I don't care about it, you won't care about it. Uh, I want that painting to do things that I, I can't even uh, conceive of at this point. And then at the end, stuff happens that I, you know, I can kind of see it when I start, but when I get done, it's like, wow, I, I've never seen that before. And if I've never seen it before, you've never seen it before. And, that's, and, and I think that's the to me, that's, that's our obligation as artists, is to show you reality in a new and different way. And of course, it's not reality, it's, 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 it's a created reality, a created world. Uh, and because we all see things exactly the same way, at least we, we think we do, because organically, but our, our experiences will uh, uh, interpret that in a different way. And that's what I want to do. So what I put on the wall is my interpretation, partly, and partly serendipity. Uh, you know, but I have to, you, as an artist, I'm doing a lot more editing than anything. I'm saying, that's good, that's not good, that's got to go away, I'm keeping that. So, you know, it's a, whatever's up there, that's what I decided to keep. So, that's, that's good. Thanks a lot. Okay, I, um, I don't know the answer to the question, but uh, when I teach, what I try to teach people is not how to paint a certain way, but how to figure out how they should be painting. So what I would like to uh, leave behind is my paintings uh, that I search from inside and produce, as opposed to uh, you know, loving Bonard and wanting to paint Bonard paintings or, or loving anybody else. Uh, so for me, it's always a search of that's a great subject matter, but do I want to paint it because it's a great subject matter or because I am responding to it? So I'm always sort of in search of myself, and I feel like that's what I want to leave behind, and when I teach, I always want to convey that. So I don't, uh, I teach very limited how to paint you know, in any particular way, anywhere. I think, I think you have to develop it as a painter. Because that's what the world wants. Everybody wants you to be you, and not to paint, you know, like Vermeer or uh, anybody else. You have to paint like you. That's what they want. That's what the public wants. I think. So, going into the unknown. That's it. That's what I like. Well, for someone who doesn't didn't know the answer, you <laughs> <laughs> pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Um. I think my answer is kind of twofold. One is I really, um, I love it when my art's hanging on the wall and I stand back and I watch people looking at my art to, to see what their uh, reaction and expression is. And it's kind of twofold. One is they're always saying, what the hell is she doing? Is it a watercolor? Is it an oil painting? What is she doing? And um, I kind of have my, uh, foot on both sides of the door. I use water-soluble oil paints, and I use them really washy, but they become like a watercolors. Um, but then I use some really odd tools. I use squeegees and kicks, and um, so people just don't kind of know what I'm doing. And I really, I, I have this spiritual thing in my mind where I start it with this real washy kind of mess with values, and let it drip, and, and that to me is the um, natural world, because the paint kind of does its own thing. And then I go in with some of these tools, which I call my man-made world, and that's when I carve out like, architecture and buildings. And so it's almost like me and the painting are working together to create this thing. And that's going to sound very odd, but I really love when my painting does a lot of it. You know, sometimes some of the drips, I leave them. I never take them away. They're just perfect. They become tree trunks or you know, some background shape or... So, so that's one thing. And then another thing is I really like to... I, like, I love people to feel a kind of sense of nostalgia when they look at my paintings. Um, I'm more or less a tonalist, so my paintings kind of maybe might look like a old sepia photo or something. And a lot of times I won't put things of modern world, like modern cars or whatever. So I, I like people to say, oh, that looks like grandma's house, or I remember when I did. 
So I, I love that, and um, and that's what. Um, for me, it's all about the energy, and um, and I think what Andy was saying is that he didn't really, when he said he didn't know the answer to the question, sometimes we're, we can almost feel like we're vehicles for creative energy, and uh, you, some people call it creative source energy, and I think that it's put here for a reason, and I think it's our, I know, I feel that it's my responsibility to, um, you know, to use a familiar analogy, to, to till up the soil for this creative energy, which then comes like a, a seed. And if I've done my homework and I know um, about composition and I know about design and color and texture and all these, these the technical aspects of the painting, um, then I try to go out and just forget it all and just let myself be a vehicle for this creative source energy. And it actually comes in a wave of physical energy. So, you know, I can tell like when I'm going to work on a big painting, if I don't get to my easel in time, you can ask my wife Jennifer. I'm like bouncing off the walls in the house, and I'm like, oh, I feel like I could wrestle a grizzly bear. I need to go work on this painting. So for me, um, when I'm in the zone is when that energy comes through the, the medium, whether it be oil paint, acrylic, watercolor, whatever I'm doing. Um, it's for, you know, it's a physical sense of energy for me, and I think it's it's it, it serves a purpose um, in the grander scheme of things, and I think that's what inspires all artists. Um, you know, is this is this energy that comes through, and then I feel like it's my job to harness it and make it a, a manageable thing that then can be transferred to the viewer, so that when they're seeing the work, they experience the excitement, um, the joy, the mystery, the sadness, whatever the emotion is, whatever the feeling is, whatever the moment has, um, you know, that I'm able to to convey that. Um, and you know, if I don't do my part by reading the books and taking the time to study uh, past masters, and, and you know, then I'm not going to be able to properly harness it. So, but when I actually go out there, I try to forget everything and just be let myself be a vehicle for uh, this thing that has inspired so many artists before us. And I always tell people, you know, whatever was in Da Vinci, it's in you too. You just you can you can get to it. It's there. So. To me, that's the biggest expression for me is, is about creative energy in all of its work. So he goes by me in art. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think what these guys saw me covered a lot, said a lot. Um, um, I think that there's a there's a technical aspect where you're learning about. You know, so you can make the crap. If you're a writer, you want to learn how to construct sentences and use language word painters so you can line, shape, color, value, texture, edges, things like that. And so um, that's one aspect of it. But I think there's another aspect where, at least for me, I need to have some sense of a feeling or a mood to kind of to hang all that structural stuff on. Um, maybe something drawn from memory, dreams, um, just the general feeling you maybe can't describe where it's from. But you have this sense of, uh, it's like the sense of purpose in this thing. And you're driven by it, by that. That's what's driving the work. And I think that's really kind of the thing that people, you know, the average person doesn't know anything about. People haven't studied art don't know about, well, that's, that's not, you know, you got some big value going on there. You know, they just look at the piece and they're affected by it. They don't know why. Um, and I guess I would compare it to, you know, it's not, it can't just be about the structural, the technical side of the craft. There's got to be something else, too. And that's why I agree with, like Lon said, you know, it's, it, it, it can't just be the workshop thing where you take a workshop with a teacher and you're like, here's how you do this and you do this. And I've seen in my experience a lot that happens with that is at the end of the workshop, if you're, it's kind of like you're giving people a fish at a workshop. You're not teaching people how to fish at a workshop. So they end up producing paintings that a lot of times resemble the painting that the teacher that was given in the workshop, right? Um, but if you just give them the raw tools, like Andy was saying, give them the raw things. This is how you work. This is a color wheel. This is like basics of design. This is how you draw. You know, um, you can deal with all that stuff. But the, but the actual person has to come out, and I think that's where the other happens. I think that's where the art comes out of it. Kind of like how I was, you know, when you, when, when you start putting yourself into it, you kind of forget all that stuff and just start working. That's when the that's when the real you or, or, or you let the mood of that whatever that thing is come out of you. Why are you 
why are you painting this thing? That's one of the hardest things I'm struggling with right now. It's like asking that question. It's like, why do I want to paint this? What is it about this thing that's driving me to make this? Um, there are a lot of structural things I can think of. And one thing I'm thinking of is um, in, in music, you have the 20th century composers like Schoenberg and Edgar Varese. It's really technically structured music, but it's almost unlistenable. You can't listen to it for more than five minutes. It's cold. It is, it's all technique. There is none of that emotional side, mood side that's put into it. So that that's part of it that drives it for me too. So that's my sound. There's some deep stuff going down. Right, right, right. I won't ask because they pretty much said it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, really. All right. Lena, Well, I just it'd be really hard to add anything to it. For me, it's definitely the emotional response to the place. I find myself going back to the same place over and over again and trying to see it in a different light. But usually the scene just captures me on one or another level. And I think it's based on, like I think <coughs> most of us are perhaps, based on our own experiences, you know, our museums that we went to, books that we read, how we grew up. Um, as they say, beauty in the eye of a beholder. So. It's your beauty to find, and that's what it's for me. So I look for that beauty, and I look for that emotional response, because, like I said to you before, I spend time in the studio, and holding that emotional response for three or six months is quite incredibly difficult. It's possible, but it's difficult. But here it's so instant, it's so wonderful, and everything, even the energy of nature helping you to do this. And I don't usually go in the very abstract, but I do always look for something abstract in the scene. So it's a kind of a two, th two things that have to come together for something more realistic, I guess, as you see in the end uh, come out. And I definitely look for the emotional response, like pretty much what you said. <laughs> so. uh, my painting style is so bad, but I look for changes all the time. Uh, we're all visual engineers, I think, and we're problem solvers. And look at different problems that uh, whatever you might be trying to paint or get across a particular painting. Uh, I think I'll sort of look at, in the last few years, last maybe 10 years or so, I've been looking for sort of a spiritual aspect to this, uh, uh, balance and things like that uh, to my paintings. And, but more recently, I've been trying to, um, uh, I think influenced by Russian painters that uh, uh, look at some of their work. I'm more, now more involved with brush strokes and things like that. Actually, every brush stroke is a fault. And editing and um, still trying to get the balance and things like that. But I don't really have any particular aspect I think I'm trying. Just, it's just I'm trying to capture that, but I never do. It's, it's very loose, it's very slippery. And so, you know, my next painting, my favorite painting is always the next one getting ready to start. You start with that first stroke and then relate to that one stroke. And then that stroke, next stroke relates to the other two strokes and things like that. So that's what I, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that's my train of thought. You answered it. Now the question again was about the essence, what drives us? What, uh, what do you bring? Brings. What, what, how do we recognize you? Um. What, do you, what is your intent? My intent. I'd like, I guess, it, I, as much as I would like to paint like somebody else, and I've, I've tried learning by doing that, whatever happens comes out of me, comes out of me. It is, I am what I am. <laughs> and I try to get out there and capture something, to me it's important, um, those magical moments, and it's always about the light. And people drive by and don't notice the world around us anymore. We're just crazy busy, 100 miles an hour all the time. People don't appreciate just the little stuff that we have. And I, I found that out when I moved, you know, to the beautiful Hudson Valley. I'm 12 minutes from Vanderbilt Mansion and one of the most beautiful vistas. You know, I, I go to these places and, and my neighbors have never driven there. And you know, it's like 12 minutes away. You haven't been there? It's because people take it for granted because it's their backyard. We're too busy, they don't appreciate, and we're losing a lot of that. And so, what I'm trying to do, and it's important to me, not only it makes me happy, you know, if it makes you happy, wonderful. <laughs> but 
Um, it, it makes me happy, and that's my joy and passion. And it's, it is an adrenaline rush for me because it, it's all about capturing that fleeting moment. So that's, what, that's what I do. Uh, well, I guess what I bring to the table, it's not storytelling as much as it's the dynamics of what I see, the dynamics of life, uh, a play with color and how color moves. I mean, whether the leaf is, you know, flipping over. I mean, life's never static. My paintings aren't static. I'm trying to basically create like a visual symphony. I want the highs, I want the lows. Um, I'm using what I see as the inspiration. Uh, before I was able to identify my work, people would say, oh, that's yours, I know it's yours. Um, it is, you know, I like the color field papers, I like the impressionists, I like the futurists, I mean, I like the dynamics and movement, and I think it is pretty different. Uh, I don't see it as being that different because I see it every day, mm -hmm. but it is, you know. Uh, you know, I've had people say, well, what's your subject? And it's, I just sort of say it's a symphony. It is a visual um, reflection of music, light, dance, and colors. I guess with me, um, it's, uh, you know, I'm interpreting what I'm seeing. I'm interpreting nature. Um, and if I see something uh, that really excites me, then, uh, you know, I have sort of an emotional reaction to that subject, whether it's the way the light's hitting or the, the subject itself. Uh, when that happens, then I'm excited about what I'm painting, and that's what I try to get that feeling into my pain, whatever it is, like, so that other people can experience, you know, what I'm experiencing through my work. Um, it doesn't always work out so good, but um, I think that's mostly what it's about, because, you know, we're, we're looking at something three-dimensional, and we're interpreting it with, you know, brush strokes with different colors, so um, I don't want to just render something like, oh, there's a, a car or a house, and I, you know, I, I mean, I want people to be able to look at it and be able to recognize it and know that it, it's authentic. Um, but I don't want it to be so um, rendered that, you know, there's no uh, emotion or not, no part of me. Um, and so, and I think we all paint things that we relate to for one reason or another. Um, I see paintings of the Southwest, and I've not spent much time out there, so I don't really get it, get it you know? I mean, they're beautiful colors, but uh, I don't react to that um, like I do with subjects uh, in the Northeast, where I'm from. And, uh, you know, yeah, early in my career, and all throughout my uh, career, I, I go to museums and I see, uh, you know, these all home or why I was in. Influenced by you know, you know, Sargent. I just love the way he just with mm -hmm. his strokes just say it. But yes, yeah, it has emotion and it's um, I don't know, it's just darn good. You know? So I'm striving to be able to do that, and uh, it's sort of a combination. You know, you want you want the, the viewer to have the emotional reaction. Um, uh, you want to say something. You want it, I want it to be authentic, but not uh, just dull and, you know, rendered. Okay. All right, I'm ready for something. <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody got it, but it's like it, it's, it's, there's so much uh, that I can totally relate to with what everybody said. But as far as what I bring to the table when it comes to painting, um, I'm a selfish person. I just paint for myself. Uh, I paint things that I respond to. I don't think about what other people are going to think about. I, I respond to what my inner voice is. That's why I think is to bring out that inner voice, to find myself, to look for what am I responding to? How do I, do 
develop this voice. I mean, because I can't sing, but I, I can you know, paint. I try to paint, and all these paintings are just a series of steps to furthering that voice, to bring it out, to to expand it. And that really comes to driving around. Why do I drive around? Why why do I? Some people, I don't want to paint that, or I see a list, and oh, okay, I'll go here and the list. For me, it's, I just got to get in the car or just get out on the road and just walk around and find that unexpected. That's where I find um, subjects that speak to me. I feel it's a, an honest approach for my voice. Uh, it, it's something that I have to be there at that moment. Tomorrow I can come back and it's gone. Things changed or something else is gone. Um, Sometimes uh, I get in my local hometown that I'm kind of like the harbinger of doing I'll paint something and then a week or a month or a year later it's gone. <laughs> and it's like, hey, remember the painting you did of you know the pier? It's gone. You know, hey, you know that locksmith shop, they painted it. You know, uh, it's it's uh, you know, they hate the landfill, we have all that, you know, Hurricane Matthew wiped out that driveway you painted. Uh, it's it's you haven't this painted any of us this weekend. <laughs> 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 Trust me, <laughs> if I don't like you, I'll paint. <laughs> um, so, but I mean, I think that's really why I paint. Um, is is I'm looking for my own voice. I'm looking, you know, how do I express myself? And that's why I, I toil through. Uh, unsavory conditions and, and, and nature and rain and wind and uh, you know it's a chance to experience nature and to express my own self through the pain. Okay. It's good to have a superpower. <laughs> yeah. I haven't heard that one yet. <laughs> um, okay well um, originally I had a list of like 12 questions, but they turn the lights out at midnight. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, either one or two more questions, and then I'm going to open it up to the floor if anybody has anything that they want to ask. Uh, we can do that route. Um, this is probably not one you've had before, hopefully. Um, and I'm going to take my time with it so you can sort of start formulating what you're, how you're going to say. But, we, uh, we have our heroes, our, our, our models of, of artists out in, you know, we all do, that we love, Sarge and Soroya. Uh, they all ended up doing these sort of giant master uh, epic pieces. Um, Soroya did the Seven Provinces of Spain. If you ever saw those paintings, it was just like, you just go, why do I even bother? <laughs> uh, a guy named Alphonse Mucha, if you're familiar with him at all, if you know his body of work, you're going, oh, look at that Art Nouveau, pretty woman kind of thing. And then you see his Slav epics, which are massive, mind-blowing efforts. And um, or Deven Korn in his Ocean Park series. He's, you know, he spent an entire life sort of building towards and every painting is the next, but then he gets into the Ocean Park series. It was a monumental effort. So my question to all of you is, is there anything on the horizon for you? Anything that's floating around in your head that you're thinking, this is where I'm going. This is the thing that I'm going to tackle. And you may not know. You may have thought about it. It could be a hazy idea. We won't hold you to it. You know, if you change your mind, because we're artists, you know, we do that. But is there something out there that is lighting your fire to the back of your head, and someday you're going to do this epic blank? Got anything? I have no idea, but I know plan air is dead. Um, it simply, and, 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 and not, to, not to take away anything from what we're doing, uh, it, it's, it's, it's back to fun. Uh, but we turned this whole experience you, you, just just to, to to somehow put some sort of equation with, with say Soroya, these big massive paintings. I want to do those too. I want to do large, and I do in studio. I do these large paintings. They take days, even though I work very quick. It still takes a lot of effort. You've got to make a lot of changes. You change the size. You change the format. You know, you've got to orchestrate it. It's got multiple figures, whatever it might be. Um, then we come to these things and. We've got two hours of moving on to this thing. We would turn it into a, a sporting event. Very fun. But 
Uh, I think that's the one thing that, that, that bothers me about it is that we, we, we're, sometimes we're making quantity over quality. And uh, you know, we can, I don't, no, I take that back. I don't think anybody in this room is doing that. But I think we have, it, it, there's a potential of falling into that trap. And, and the thinking that we can, when we do much larger pieces, or, or at least more, and they don't have to be large in size, but, but more in depth, more narrative, more whatever it might be, uh, where there's a lot more thought in it, uh, whether it be in studio or outside or, or whatever, um, where we don't have the time constraint. I think then we, uh, uh, I think there, there can be something more to the painting. Now, that is, and, you know, having said that, then, uh, it, does that make the paintings that we do this week uh, uh, just, you know, just quick studies? No, I don't think it's that either, because this discussion, and we, all of us, I think all of us have had this discussion in the past, there were several of us have. Uh, specifically about how do we come and do these quick paintings and put all our energies into it. And I think one of those things, so it's a mindset, you have to kind of think in terms of, I know I do, is that this is the last painting I've ever going to make. This has got to be good. I mean, it's, it, it, it may not be, it may, it may fail, but I've got to put my energies in here. I cannot be thinking about the one I'm going to do this afternoon or the one I'm going to do tomorrow or the next one I've got to have five and then all this. You have to focus your, your, your thoughts into that. And, and energy has to put in there. And then you say, well, okay, I'm only going to be here for two hours. Maybe three, maybe four, maybe five. I don't know. But I want to make this thing have some sort of relevance and, uh, you know, in the context of this activity that we do. I, I think what all of us, when we go out and do plein air uh, on our own, uh, where we've got uh, an open-ended time frame, I think uh, it's a little easier. And I think, uh, but, uh, and I think at this level, I think that 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 that, that game you play or that that, that that conflict that you have about these things, uh, uh, you know, making sure that you, this painting that I'm working on right now, at least is a, I've attempted to give it some sort of relevance. What I, what I mean by that is, it's not just a souvenir that's going on the wall and somebody's going to buy it. They're going to take it to their their, their uh, beach house. I, that's fine if they do that, but I want them to be able to realize that I've put a, a great deal of effort into this. I've made changes, I've made decisions, the same decisions I would make in the studio. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and I hope that this painting doesn't end up in the art sales you know, somewhere along the way. <laughs> you know, as long as it you know, has some relevance, you know. Uh, so your vision for the future is to not end up in the art sales. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say just quickly that um, I think it's personal, and I, uh, my answer is almost more to Larry because I don't want him to feel bad. And I'm just going to bring up like Albert Pinkham Ryder, sure. who y'all may not know. You know, you almost have to have had a little art history, but he painted these strange, dark little paintings and used all kinds of odd materials. And he once, when he became pretty well known, I, I think I read this, that he told Picasso, he goes, you and I are the only guys making good work right now. <laughs> you know, so, and then there's like Mirandi and Fouillard, who never did the epic, but their work's so epic. When you think mm -hmm. of those little VR paintings with his mom's sewing. Yeah. It's like, so I, I think, I would think it's, up to the artist, and the artist shouldn't feel bad if they don't do the thing. Yeah. No, 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 I'm not even scale. Yeah, no, no, yeah, it's not right. scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say it's not scale. The point you made about the blue yard, I remember having and showing to my class slides of some of those paintings. Yeah. And going to the east wing of the National right. Gallery, seeing the paintings, yeah. mm -hmm. and they're this big. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm just floored. They seem like they're 10 feet by yes. 12 feet. Yeah. They could the be. The visual perfect. impact yeah. is like a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And you were looking at slides and assuming well, it was I had bigger, slides and it was yeah, bigger. Yeah, yeah, and I just, you know, you look at them and they just look really big. And then when you see them, it's like when you see the Vermeers. Mm -hmm. And they're so tiny, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. Um, we are it's the same exact, if not me, the same exact effect, maybe bigger. You know, so, yeah, good point. Anything, you guys? Um, sort of on a different track, I think, I think, I've really hit the plein air circuit really hard for the last five years. And I think there's something about going to different communities and different regions that rings so true to me. Um, one of my shaman artists that sits on my shoulder when I'm painting is Andrew Wyatt. And it's like, he, he really was a regionalist. He, he, he never even went anywhere to paint. He painted in Chatsworth, Pennsylvania, in Maine. He didn't go to in France or, you know, he, he really got to know his place. and. 
um, you know, painting weekly at different places, all of a sudden we have to like switch, flip a switch and get to know that place. And um, so I, what I see for me in the future is, is, is maybe like a residency or, or something where I really spend some time in a place and really delve into the place. Um, so, but but I, I, I think this whole journey, this whole plein air circuit journey has led me to that. Um, I think, and you know, this is not necessarily uh, an idea for a painting. I mean, I definitely want to move towards large epic work that that approaches something new, but one of my main goals, and this is why this is so exciting for me, is to um, to help everybody who's doing this thing. I mean, we're in, I think we're in a, a pivotal time right now because there's been so much that's been done before us. I mean, we deconstructed forms and, you know, we had conceptual art where you had artists that said, I'm not even going to make art, I'm just going to have the idea and why waste time making it, I'm going to go to the next. <laughs> so, yeah, they're trying to, they're trying to figure out well, where, how, do we, yeah, how do we move forward? What's the cost? Are you just painting that in my head right now? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just trust me, I got some good ones. But, I'm not going to waste any time making art. We're there. Um, so, so, you know, I believe that I believe in putting castles in the, in the sky and building staircases up to them. So some people say, wow, you're taking on a lot with this goal. But I really would love to inspire everyone who's involved in this movement to think more about the bigger picture. And, you know, we're making little uh, paintings that are, you know, no pun intended, the bigger picture. But, but we're, we're making these beautiful little paintings and, and we're capturing a moment in time. But to sit here and to talk about well, where are we going with this thing now, because that's a question we have to ask ourselves is, what exactly are we doing? Because we do it so often, but we don't ever stop you know, to sit back and go, what is it that we're doing? Why are we doing it? But I think that you know, the plein air movement is one of the most organized contemporary art movements. Um, uh, you know, there's this return to representational painting, but I feel like there's more branches to that tree. You know, we went one way and there was pop art, conceptual art, and all that. But now there's like this return to representational painting, and then we're seeing this influence of like the Russian paintings, and a lot of people are on Facebook and they're seeing all these new artists that they would never have access to. So there's been this like blending of styles, and I feel like you know there's something happening. And so for me, my big goal would be to light a fire every, under everybody and say, let's let's do this, let's get the ball and move it down the court. So it's not so much. A particular painting. I do want to, you know, experiment with de deconstructing and, and getting a little bit more abstract with my stuff. And, and you know, if I could figure out how to combine the color of Monet and the values of Sargent and all that stuff, you know. But really, what am I? I would love to to play a role in taking this thing and, and moving it somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It's good stuff. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited. Every quarter on. We, yeah, we're going to make a video. We're going to be on YouTube. Oh. <laughs> just, just a word. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, I've been actually, I think if you're you know, thinking about this and doing this, it's always a struggle. I, I struggle tremendously. Um, and I have been for the you know, last couple of years, I guess. Um, I think I eventually, well, I know I eventually want to make stuff that I don't hate. That I don't just feel awful about, you know, um, the work, you know, it's, uh, it's something that feels like it's authentic, like it's me, that I'm not, uh, I guess, trying to, I, you have to start somewhere, you know, you have to start somewhere with some idea or something, um, but I guess I'm trying to get to that point, and I don't know what that body, I don't know what that work will look like, maybe I haven't made that work yet, maybe, I, maybe I'll make, maybe it'll be like, Start writing stories. I don't know. You know what I mean? It'll feel something that'll feel authentic. I don't know if it'll be a painting. Can I just hey, say nice. quickly? I'd love to hear Patrick say that because he's a wonderful painter. Mm -hmm. And um, my daughter had to do a report on Monet in school last year, and she had that quote. And so we searched for all these quotes about Monet. And Monet, when he was 86, I think he died at 87. He said, um, "My whole life has been wasted." I'm I haven't achieved anything. You know, like, if you think about what that, if like, you think about, about him and Pissarro, if you think about what they did, it'd be like if somebody invented this and there's no instruction manual at all. Right. Somebody put paint to right. 1840 yeah. yeah. and there are all these colors like Monet and, and, and Pissarro, they, they did paintings that Rembrandt would look, he'd be there and he'd say, you can't paint that. He didn't have the pigments to do it. 
they took all this new technology and said, what are we going to do with this? I don't know. Let's go out and feel here, paint this stuff, and try to mix these pigments together. They did a tremendous thing. That was high tech. That was tech they were working on. They were daring. So yeah. daring. I mean, it was so out and of And for him to say thing. that, yeah, for him yeah. to say yeah. that, yeah. I think it just goes yeah. to that idea that if you're really working, there's always this inner your feel. There's like almost like this. It's not. I'm not trying to be morose or dark. It's just like this inner craving. It's like there's got to be something more to this than I'm missing. I'm trying to put my finger on I think Leonardo is the same, same similar thing. Yeah. So Patrick's in good company. <laughs> yeah, he said, so. I think he said, I wish I would have learned to draw better. He apologized. <laughs> Leonardo apologized to God yeah. and man for letting him down and yeah, achieving yeah. what he could have done. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, Leonardo, yeah, yeah, Leonardo had some books written about him when he was in a time when, when people couldn't read. Yeah. He was a famous guy. Yeah. You know, so I, I will add one thing to, to, to put this in perspective. And uh, my uh, good friend like Tim Bell, you know Tim Bell? Oh, yeah, I know about Tim. Hell of a painter, yeah. and he's super inventive. And he was telling me one time we were sitting there having beers, and he said um, he was explaining. Someone asked him in a class what he did, and he told him he's an artist. And, and, and he, well, what's it like? He said, "Well, imagine what it's like to be disappointed every day of your life." That's what it is. That's exactly what it is. And that's that's what we struggle with. Yeah, that's something you know uh, that. This past year uh, has been somewhat of a struggle for me. You know, and I know I put uh, out the question for you know, does anybody at any moment feel like just burning everything that they've done? And they were quite a few people that chimed in. Yes, yes, and burning parties. And painting, you know, it's very cathartic. Um, but there is something to pushing yourself to failure. You know, that, that drives me. It's, it's you know, every painting. It's, it's we're struggling. I think where the uh, frustration stems from. It's so we're push pushing ourselves uh, with every painting and striving. Uh, for me, my goals are, are to be a you know, well-rounded painter, paint figure, paint life, paint still, paint from outdoors, uh, and so that you know I can learn as much as I can. Um, back to the question as far as grandiose. Uh, ideas of you know where would I take my paintings. Um, I, earlier on I was inspired by Gauguin that you know he went out into the South Pacific and you know wanted to uh, harness the um, wildness within uh, and uh, the uh, how do you say untamed heart. And uh, for me uh, one of my favorite trips was when I went with my wife and uh, family to uh, the Philippines and it was just uh, when you travel to a different country, and you, after the first few days, you start to shed the ex expectations of your own home country, and you start to shed um, your own viewpoints as grounded. You start to see that there's other viewpoints and, and, and other ways of thinking, and uh, so probably, you know, sometime down the horizon, I hope that everything that I'm doing now is taking me further along so that when you know I'm ready I can I can you know, go for a long period of time and, and try and capture you know a slice of uh, the Philippines in ways that people haven't seen you know, the media hasn't you know given and to be able to I mean it's a wonderful country uh, everybody is ridiculously happy and I've seen people that you know have very little, and yet they are super happy. And it's very intriguing to be in a country where we are very materialistic, and we have these things: have an iPhone, we have sunglasses, Apple Watch, or you know, a nice car, a house. And then you start to see how other people live, and then you start to realize there's there's something more to life, and you know there there are things out there worth chasing. That's what I'd like to do is, you know, I push myself to failure. I push myself to become a better painter so that, you know, when that time comes and I'm ready to go, uh, I'm ready and you know, I have that skill set to hopefully capture something and to make a mark uh, with all the efforts that I have in my painting so that, you know, they won't end up in a thrift shop. <laughs> or they may. They may. Yeah. Um, Van Gogh's were, you know, not really widely accepted at the time. 
he'd be freaking out right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Melina? Yeah. It's, it's interesting that you guys bring it up about being unhappy or, I guess, striving for more. To me, it's absolutely a must. That's how you know you're actually an artist. You don't have to be very skillful or anything. If you're actually striving for more, you know you're an artist, you're not a craftsman. You know who actually satisfy Because the people who do over and over and over, same thing. They cross us. As soon as you bridge to something different and you try in your own way, we all try in our own way, um, to find something that something elusive, something that sits inside of your soul that try to get out, you become an artist. You will never be happy and you will be beyond happy when you possibly somehow can touch it, maybe. And when you do, it happens and you guys react on it and that's probably one of the most beautiful things. There is. So don't be afraid of being unsatisfied. It's a gift to all of us. It's a gift of creation. But going back to things that what I want to do, as I mentioned before, I'm pushing two worlds together, kind of, you know, the very traditional one, long term, and very fast, very emotional. Like, I want to be in love right there. I want to emotionally respond. That's, that's the mandatory. And at the same time, I'm coming from uh, Ukraine, which is Russian artist of every year. <coughs> but then I come in here to the United States and here the uh, Hudson Valley artist. And again, I'm staying very traditional because that's where my heart is. And I'm pushing those two together. <coughs> one was out color, the other one crazy colors. And you will see actually more color in my paintings because they're people, traditional, People looking at me, I'm like, what are you doing? I was like, I love color. But I love the romanticism of the scene, and I love the emotion of respond, and I continuously try to push those two things together. Sometimes it fails, sometimes it succeeds. Sometimes it makes me happy for that very, very brief moment of time until I think, I can do better. I can do something else. And of course, there's another world of mine that I'm continuously pushing together, figure it out. And that has actually been, I think landscape has been kind of a blessing to me because a couple of years back when I got into it, I started to respond more genuinely to the world around me, which is, I think right now, I am actually working on seven by eight painting in my studio, trying to incorporate the figurative, the landscape, the emotion, the design, the ornament, trying to push those things together and see where it's going to go. I hope it's going to be okay, but it's a process. And it's probably, I would not trade it for anything. I could not do the same thing over and over again. I tried it. Wow, it's not just me miserable. I think everyone else is miserable. So I'm better off in a studio. <laughs> and that's actually kind of, and of course it's been inspired by um, Hudson River School. They did a one painting. They would collect all of those artists, uh, and artists, not, not artists, but all of those people to go and view that grand view. Of course, that was a way of showing things back in the days, but it's created such an emotional response. And actually, as a matter of fact, it's been done just recently. It was a one painting um, was on display, only one painting in the room. They were trying to recreate that idea of not just multitude of paintings that you go through and you're like, oh, okay, 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 but how that one particular painting can create the emotional response. And it was a very successful one. And that's kind of very sad for me. So I don't know where is it gonna go. It's pretty exciting. It's very scary. It's even kind of intimidating to talk about it because it is very personal and private, but like I said before, we all creature of our past. And I would try, I'm trying to embrace it as much as I can and try to put it together and see where it's going to end up. It's kind of like a soup of unknown ingredients. And I would always say to all my students, you do it your way because it's your experiences that you put in together. I, you can have drawing skills, you can you know about the color, you can know a lot of things, but eventually how you put it together, that's that's really where the art is. And so many of them failed. I'm like, I'm reading a lot right now about Russian Kuritvishniki. 
Uh, their biographies, oh my goodness, were they tormented. Levitin, I don't know if you guys know Levitin. He probably was the most tormented person, artist there is. He created the most emotional, beautiful work there is. So, yeah, combine insanity and insanity. That's, I guess, where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Elena. Well, that's I feel personally that uh, able to make a living is full-time artists and very blessed. And <clears throat> I think being an artist is like going ahead of a, you, you, it's a dark room. You go into you go, uh, you go to this dark room. There's a little crack in the door on the other side, but somewhere in that room there's a hole. <laughs> You're not allowed to turn the lights on, so you find your way. You're always striving to get there, and. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's a kind of analogy I think as far as personal. Um, I don't think I'm really ever satisfied. I mentioned that earlier uh, about, uh, about my work. I'm not sure where it's going, although I would like my my paintings to look bigger than they are, but I feel like it's, it's uh, unreachable, but it's something I strive for. And on a selfish note, I've never really shared uh, what little I know about art. I had people come and ask me in the area where I live, which is a very rural area. And I, like to, I would like to start sharing that, uh, my, what, what I, little I can teach people. I'm going to start doing that this year uh, or maybe next year. So that's, that's my goal. Right? That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Pay it on. Pay it forward. Uh, for me, I don't think anyone addressed this yet. Um, it's baby steps for me. It, I, I find it epic. Uh, working with people. I, I, I'm lucky enough that uh, people who like my style seek me out, they commission me to do work, they buy works, but trying to bridge what they envision with my style, that that's what attracted them, mm -hmm. to put something that's going to really mean something to them, that's going to be their prized possession, that um, connects with their vision of it. I mean, I had a lady on, take me up on the hill that she wanted me to paint. And she sobbed when she saw the painting. For me, that's epic. I get goosebumps. Just, you know, that something I can do can mean so much to somebody else and their family. So every painting I want to be that epic. If I'm working for myself, that's one thing. And when somebody loves it, that, that makes the world turn for me. But when they're commissioning me to do something, and sometimes, and we've all been there, when people point out, okay, this is what I want, and, or this is the best, and you as an artist look at it and go, but this isn't even a good composition, or this might not make a great painting. But to capture what they feel and love about it, and yet make a good painting out of it by bridging the two visions together, yours and theirs, that, that they're going to be happy. To me, that every one I do seems to be, that's the next epic thing. I like that one thing. I think it's good to be humble, uh, you know, uh, because I, for, personally, I, I have seen my artwork at, at Fleet Market, so you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good check. Yeah. Did you buy it? <laughs> I do think 
you know, with the anti-aesthetic movement in art, it sort of hurts society. So I do think we need beauty, even if it's sort of weird. Um, so I haven't figured it out yet. But I do know that, one, I would much rather paint a large wall than a small painting. I like the issue of scale. Um, but I want to eventually try to figure out how to paint something that has social relevance. Besides just, I mean, you know, I love beautiful paintings, traditional beautiful painting. It's not what I do. I hope what I do has some kind of element of beauty to it, because uh, I do think society's in need of it. It helps raise our ideals. Uh, but I need to do something that without being contrite, has some social relevance, and it's somewhere down the line. Mm -hmm. awesome. Neil, you have seven seconds. <laughs> <laughs> what they said. <laughs> no, first I gotta say, that's um, around what some of these other people talking about. I think it was about 10 years ago, I felt that I had arrived, because I went to a garage sale, and there was one of my paintings for sale for 15 bucks. <laughs> I got ten. <laughs> <laughs> that really happened. Deal. Uh, but no, I um, I've been thinking about this actually. I'm not going to do any like super giant paintings anytime soon uh, unless I have some place to put them. Uh, it's a little impractical for you know this day and age. Like back in the day, they you know they, they had places to put stuff like that. But you know what are you going to do with it? Uh, I guess if it's good enough. I have been thinking um, of slowing down from the like the clean air circuit thing a little bit and focusing more on uh, you know painting what I want to paint and like we we go like from one place to another and we see all this stuff and we're like very quickly responding to it and all that. It's been really wonderful um, experience, but uh, at some point I want to um, do maybe a series of paintings. Not necessarily big. Probably start out with small studies. With the idea that I am going to make some statement that is larger and uh, important to me, and it'll probably involve um, my family, uh, you know, like figures. Um, I have a lot of grandchildren, and um, you know, I, I don't really know exactly what it's going to be, but I I, I, I want to do that. Um, when I, and I before I started doing the Clean air circuit. I used to do this gallery painting. And I did do some larger paintings, uh, some of which took me over a month to do. And it worked out well. I mean, I sold them. And, um, so I, and I don't want to spend that much time on painting at this point, but I want to do something a little more substantial than you know the stuff that I'm doing now that has to be done in a day or two. You know, like something I can really think about and going back to like just develop ideas but it's, it's one thing we don't have uh, an opportunity to do when we're doing these uh, festivals and things but anyway awesome yeah. awesome well thank you all for uh, really some really good stuff that came out of this um i'm going to open it up to you i have a question that and i'm afraid i don't remember your name the second person cynthia yeah. cynthia you had made a comment earlier about a symphony and that you um, take music and can either feel that in your painting. I, um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Instead of having a single specific subject, I mean a symphony happens over time. It has highs and lows, it has different notes, it has, you know, little tickles and it has big booms. And it's what I try to do with a visual correlation of that. Mm -hmm. um, so when you walk away and you let's say you're finished or you're part way there, you can you can feel that in the Yeah, pain. I mean if it's like that painting standing by a brook, 
Okay, I mean, you hear the babbling, you hear some mm -hmm. birds, I mean, you see a flutter by, I used to say to the grandkids, um, fly by. Um, those things get incorporated and yet the intense, strong structures, let's say, of the trees. Mm -hmm. uh, I want it all there in one thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of, you know, it's why, you know, I don't have a specific focus in the painting, mm -hmm. but, you know, it has to do with the issue of time, you know, how things move, the time that I spent on past, but the fact that time is this fleeting thing, you know, that's, uh, and I guess, you know, a symphony takes a fair amount of time, and but we sit there and we listen to it, and, you know, I don't know if that really answered. Yeah, thank you. Can I, can I add something to that? Because that, 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 you and I have talked about this. That, that, that idea of, you know, when we think of a painting on the wall, it's that top surface, that's what you see. You see the end result or the, or, or the, or the byproduct, however you want to look at it. But the making of it, I was a photographer for years, and so everything is done in the 60th of a second, so it's, just, it's like this. But a painting, the difference between a painting to a photograph, the painting takes time, you know? And, and when we do, particularly when we're doing plein air, and particularly when the sun is out, and if it takes two hours, that sun is moving quite a bit. So what we do is we, we paint to a time, because the shadow's going to move. So we're painting, we start, and we're painting to shadows that are going to happen. And then we paint, and then the shadows happen, and then we then we paint back to the shadows as, as time has passed. But, and we build a painting from the surface this way, and there's all these things that we've put into that painting, uh, decisions, and, and, and we put it in, we take it out. You know, we're making all these, so, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, and I don't know how to, how, I've often thought about this, because you folks just get to see the top surface, and yeah. there's a whole bunch of stuff under there. That you That's why uh, uh, Vincent Desiderio calls it the technical narrative. The technical narrative. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, you know, so, and, 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 and again, to equate it to music, which is, it, is a whole different kind of art form, but a music, you listen to a piece of music, you listen from the beginning to the end, and you have nothing to show for it except an experience. And, and you know, painting can be kind of looked at that same way. Yes, you've got a tangible object that you put on the wall, but, but Sorry, it was created in much the same way that a piece of music was created. So, uh, from the beginning and end, and you know, it's, it's where we start and we fade off. We move on to the next thing. So, uh, and, and I think it's, and, it, and that's just a, a, a mindset of keeping that in mind when you, when you look at a painting. It's, it's not just that top surface, it's in the whole. So. Yeah, that, uh, Analogies between music and poetry and painting are pretty substantial. You know, there's a just overarching thematic uh, concept. There's um, big notes. Um, there's highs and lows. There's spaces of chaos. There's spaces of rest. You know, it's, it's you can. It helps to think about paintings as music, or even music as paintings. So, any other questions? No. Natalia. Oh, Natalia. Uh, I, have the <laughs> I have a question about motivation. So, did you have a loose motivation? What motivated you to work? So, something around whatever. Well, okay. Oh my God! Can I, can I just say something? Because again, I was reading a lot of different biographies of Russians, and like you all guys know, and talking about motivation, some of them would not paint for three weeks, four weeks, sometimes a year. Uh, Surik have stopped painting for almost five years when his wife died. And I mean, talking of motivation. And then he saw something beautiful, it moved him. Again, it's the emotion happened and something clicked and here it is. I don't know, it's just like, I have to say it because it's just too much information there. That I've been <laughs> so, Wills? So it's okay to not be motivated for periods of time. It really is because it's experience. The whole art, your life is experience. You've got to allow experience take you where it's going to take you. It's okay. It's, it's okay not to be motivated. But there is definitely something like um, Rebbe, for instance, right? I'm going to be on that for a little bit. <clears throat> Sorry. But what was very interesting about him when he was a child, his uncle brought him paints, right? 
and he stayed painting. He never seen that before, so that's the first time he's seen it. And he painted for two or three days, I don't remember right now, non-stop, until his nose started to bleed. Well, I'm thinking maybe he got poisoned himself because he'd been doing it for three days, but it was something more. They were saying that he was kissed by muse. He really never let go of the idea and urge to create. But at times, sometimes it's difficult too, because things happen in your life. And that's okay, because that will bring you more into your creative process. It's okay, let it in. Let it be, let it brew, and then see what's gonna happen. Because if you have this urge as an artist, it's not gonna go away. It doesn't die. It might be stopping because you have negative emotions of some sort that kind of blocking that other energy that comes from somewhere, we don't know where, but at the same time, it's, I think it's totally, absolutely okay. I think it's a transitional period that very important. And yeah, I'll, I'll look, um, if I didn't paint for five years, uh, I'd probably uh, have to get a job at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you did a pretty big commission, and people said for life, basically. So. Uh, <laughs> Like Robert Henry said, like, well, I don't know. <laughs> that we have to live first and paint second so we have something to paint about. And it's like the fire's always going, but sometimes we have to go have experience. You were saying you have to, you have to go out and experience things. Cause that, that's like adding kindling to the fire and getting it going again. And, you know, uh, we have to, it's like the people that were chopping wood and they didn't stop to sharpen their axe. And then the guy came and said, you know, you need to stop and sharpen your axe. You'll get a lot more. So I always think about, like, you know, when I'm doing other stuff, I'm, we're, we're always working and there's always that creative thing that's happening so um, inactivity is not necessarily inactivity when you're an artist there's there are times I mean you could go sit on a mountaintop for a whole day and then come back and your skills will have been improved just from taking the time to shut off and get in touch with you know the, the present moment and to be there so I think that that that's really there's a lot to be said for that that, that, that maybe motivation um, Motivation comes in waves, but that's probably by design, so that we can have time to to gain those experiences, so that we have yeah. something to say. Because so I always think we're not craftsmen. That's okay if you don't, you know, have a nail in the shoe or whatever you're doing. You know, it's okay. It's okay if you don't sew in as a scurry or whatever. I don't know. You know, put a table together. It's okay because you're trying for new table, something different. You're trying to advance something. And again, is if I was successful at it, I have no idea. I'm trying. I actually had a good conversation with Tim Bell about this. He's a good, he's a good guy. If you ever get a chance, you can talk to him about that. He talked about how Bellows was actually a fighter. Mm -hmm. How he would, you know, you see that get punched in the mm -hmm. face. Yeah, and there were guys that were that guy like I don't know, Hibber or something. Guys like that. You know, they would go do, they would go do hard, they would go do hard stuff, live real life, and paint, show it. That's that Howard Pyle philosophy. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, go do what you are going to paint so that you can know what it feels yeah. like to do that. Yeah. And Tim Bell's fun to talk about that. Yeah. Get a chance. He's, he's great. That is actually kind of remarkable. Like when you work in, when you're doing a portrait, I probably drive everyone nuts. Like when, if someone actually doing a portrait with me, I love talking to a model. I love when they interact with me. I actually like when they get up. I'm doing a very realistic portrait, but somehow it just goes in into the work. I don't know how that happens. Maybe I don't need to know. <laughs> I, think part, I think part of the price creative people pay is sometimes it just doesn't work. And sometimes they work for days from personal experience. And then it clicks, you get into the zone, and it's great. And that's part of the motivation. You hope to catch that wave that day and just ride. It's like a high. You, know? you got that high. You always want to get there. <laughs> but do any of you know what it is that there's that high? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to be, not to put in a plug, but I'm going to be talking tomorrow somewhere. At the well, Bath County Public Library at yeah. 10. About mm -hmm. 10, thanks. Uh, about creative process and, uh, and where, where motivation comes from, where inspiration comes from, all the components of the creative process. So uh, if you want to stop by at 10. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> so motivation okay. uh, Actually, brother. Larry has a wonderful book. I don't know if the artist knows it. I'm sure all the artists know. Fishing for Elephants. Uh, no, he did not pay me to get the plug. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Or was it? It is retroactive. Larry, did you, bring, did you bring a box with you? I, I did. I only brought five books with me, so. But it, enough to sort of to show you. You can get them on Amazon, but it's not about me right now. It's about them. But tomorrow's about me. <laughs> one thing that I find that is very motivational for me is uh, as I look at artists' lives and, and how they persevere through life, one of my uh, most inspirational is Chuck Close. Mm -hmm. um, he had this spinal rupture. Wasn't a fan of his work before the um, accident or what would plague him as far as that rupture. Uh, but how he persevered continue to paint what it goes through is it makes any little obstacle in my life seem so insignificant to be to uh, overcome compared to what he does for his massive works and there I mean it's just so amazing now and, and he's a huge hero to me as far as, as an artist who perseveres and, and overcomes and not only does he overcome but I feel his work is so much uh, for me better. I mean, to sit there and paint square by square, it's maddening to, to I mean, and then he's got facial blindness. Uh, you can't recognize his face, and so, I mean, it's just, mm, right. just on top of that, and then he just paints square by square, and he's looking, and he's got a grid, and it's it's somewhat formulated, but I mean, I just, I, I'm just amazed at how he can, he knows what to do, and, and he makes it these, these really emotional paint portraits. The cool thing about him is that he developed a process to be an end around for, the, for his roadblocks. And it's when you get into his work, you realize it's what he did with the process. Like every painting has a different, he has a different way of hand, handling the pixel, you know. Yeah. And he is, he's a genius, obviously. I love his quote about inspiration is for amateurs, the rest of us should just show up and get to work, right? <laughs> <laughs> Larry, can I just say one quick thing? Yeah. This just happened literally a half an hour ago with Lon and I. Lon had pulled up and we had our cars, you know, we had our windows down and we all painted a ton all week and I heard some, you know, bad family news today and it just it was just like, you know, I just don't have it in me. And he said, yeah, I'm going to go read a, a magazine, you know. Ten minutes later, I was set up to paint and he set up to paint. And, and we were like, what are you doing? And he says, it's because this is what we do. This is what we do. And you know we do it because this is all we know how to do. Yeah, <laughs> so, we, so, we, so we stood shoulder to get a emotional. We should we stood shoulder to shoulder and paid for half an hour. We didn't really talk to each other, but it's it's what we do. I didn't have to. I've painted ten paintings, twelve paintings. You know, that could be done. But it's what it's what we do. Yeah, I think to be in this business, you have to really be in pain. You can talk about talent, but I think it's more like you just you just got to do it. You know, it's not that you're born with you know some knowledge that other people don't have. It's just like it's just what uh, I can personally feel. It's what I'm meant to do, and it's uh, I I feel good when I do it. You know, I just enjoy it. I don't always feel good when I look at the painting. <laughs> Whether it's based on like circumstances, whatever it is, it's a conscious decision that this is what we do. And yeah, you can say, okay, forget it, I will go work at Walmart or something. But, you know, you make a decision to do it. And there are good times, there are times that just happen by magic, you know, no, don't know, it's like magic. Wow, that painting just happened. And there were times that you struggle. And uh, and then you get in your car and you think and you think and you think. And I take a photo on my phone, so I look through my painting and, so, and I turn it upside down. It's like, what's bugging me? You know? It's, uh, I couldn't do it while I was raising kids. I taught instead. Because it is all encompassing. You wake up in the middle of the night or at 3 a.m. or at 5 a.m. because you can't figure something out. And it's how, how many how many have missed their exit because they're busy thinking about it. 
Jacksonville. <laughs> yeah. Look at those Bunch of, bunch of four-year-olds. <laughs> Awesome stuff. Any, any last questions for you? Uh, I, I'd like to know when everybody started painting you. When you got serious about it. Uh, in my case, I, I took art lessons like in fourth grade, and I never thought of being an artist. I played going to high school and stuff. And, um, yeah, I just uh, I went to a community college uh, for a year. It was like being in high school again, so I got a job, and then I'm like, you know. This working isn't all that much fun. But I was painting like for fun, you know, for something to do. And then I ended up going back uh, to college and debating and illustration. Uh, but I, I'm one of 11 children. Where I was, and um, my mother always referred to me as, oh, this is Neil, the artist of the family. I don't know why. You know? I mean, I guess I like art. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, that's You're my like, story. <laughs> Mine's Buddy? longer. <laughs> um, made art in high school. Didn't want to go to college, ended up with a free ride, so I went. Basically, I graduated, though I attended for a year, because it was the kind of school you'd bring your portfolio in at the end of the semester, and you'd get credit or you didn't. Um, did stuff with Department of Mental Health, did all sorts of other things, and decided later on I would paint. And I painted outside, not knowing plein air painting. Um, sort of taught myself how to paint. I was doing like these five foot canvases, which is why I was outside, because the house was maybe the size of the table. Um, had a family in stuff, because I couldn't make art. I had been selling stuff in a gallery in New York and in Philly, and I just sort of pulled out to raise the kids and teach. And uh, because of my theater work, got a job doing some murals for a restaurant in New York. Started to earn some money, and uh, it's like, called my son, who's more of a Hudson River painter. I said, I think I'm going to go back to making art professionally. He said, paint representationally. Because he had seen my early youthful stuff. And I did six paintings, five different styles, and decided I need to be outside and discover plein air. And so this is my version of <laughs> representational. <laughs> Uh, and I started this about six years ago. I, I guess I grew up watching my grandpa paint, and I always wanted to paint. I always did. I always did the paint my numbers and do my own thing. And then uh, I just painted on and off over the years, but you know, I come from a very rural area in North Dakota, and we didn't have art education. We didn't have art in high school. so. Um, I just did what I did, and I would make some money here and there at it, and didn't take it too seriously, because back there they said, oh, that's, really, that's nice, but you can't make a living doing that. And that's what I had in my head. So, <laughs> and so I went out and entered a plein air event, and, and uh, that first one wasn't very successful, but then I kept that, the painting, and all of a sudden I realized, yes, I can make a living doing this. I shouldn't listen to anybody telling me otherwise. So since then, I've been very happy to, to be able to do to do that. And uh, I just remember that I'm naive, and I still don't know a lot. I sit here with these people throwing and dropping names, and, and I don't know them. I remember when I did my first plein air event in 2006, I thought the Hudson River School, I thought there was a school somewhere. <laughs> I honestly didn't know the painters. I hadn't been to museums. So I have a long way to go to learn, and I, I am open to learning. But I, I still can do what I do because that's that's my way. I started painting dry brush watercolor at ten years old. I guess casings, uh, uh, life happened with college, and I did, uh, uh, got a job. T-shirt artist in Virginia. I saw Robert Bateman's work in 1978. Uh, 
Soil and Land magazine changed my life. I started uh, doing wildlife. I quit my job. Based on trying to get wildlife, wildlife markets for 20, about 20 years in doing acrylics. And uh, back the oils, acrylics, all, threw all my acrylics away in the oils. And uh, so I'm still spreading paint. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, this minute's kind of funny because I actually should blame my mom for this. Um, blame because for a while she told me that you cannot make money as an artist, so I have a fashion designer degree and I became a graphic designer and all of those strange things that I did in my life and always wanted to paint, right? But the reason why I'm saying I'm blaming my mom for it because I never took naps. <sighs> my poor mother. So what to do, right? How you can keep the child quiet while do the chores. Well, apparently, um, she put, she figured, well, I'm going to cover the light, maybe she'll be quiet. Well, she put a colorful umbrella, colorful, <clears throat> right there, over my crib, and I was quiet for a while. And she's like, oh, this is cool, you know, that's great. So next thing, it didn't preoccupy me for a very long time, but eventually, you know, she figured it out. If she put paintings underneath the umbrella, you know, where the spokes are, I would be quiet for as long as she needs to. <laughs> and I said, Mom, how can you tell me that I should not be an artist if you kind of made it happen? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I've been, that's kind of like, but full-time artist, I've been five years, completely full-time, so that's, that's what I do. And it was interesting, and I'm going to translate this. Uh, and I don't know how it's gonna, it's, it's a little funky the way how it translates because translating from languages is a little strange, but a friend of ours that we were having a dinner, having drinks and talking about art and all that stuff, um, Irina, do you remember? She actually said the one thing, um, she's actually quite a well-known uh, artist in Russia, and she has said one thing, you know, being an artist is not a profession, it's diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I've always drawn, and something I've always, uh, I'm sure everybody here was, you know, the, art, the artist in the class, and it was just, you know, everybody, you know, there's the jock, there's the funny guy, there's the, <laughs> everybody, you know, yeah, the first, you know, the stoners, and all that stuff, uh, and I was always the guy that drew, and, yeah, and, uh, you know, that, that translated to college, and, I flip flopped around in college between computer graphics and 3D. And then I got out of the college and I ended up doing the web. And, uh, and, uh, and I got jobs because I can draw. But you had all these web designers that no one can draw. So I always found myself quickly getting jobs because I can draw. And then um, from there, you know, I work in different places. And then I happened to see a local. Event. I'd already become part of a drawing group, and that was, for me, my outlet was the figure drawing group, my girlfriend drawing group, and uh, you know, we meet once a week, and I started getting into painting because uh, the figure, every Tuesday, of the first Tuesday of every month was painting night, and so I started painting from life, and it was uh, fun, it was something that we never really did in college, this painting, it was always charcoal or Conte crayon or marker or gestures, but three hours and, and to paint the figure was you know, really challenging and it was a lot of fun and then we started doing painting in the drawing group throughout the whole sessions every time so you know through gestures you know just get little ones and then plop them down and then you know okay now we're going to do 20 minutes so I'd get like an 8 by 10 and then next it was 9 by 12 and then 12 by 16 and then, um, and then the three hour I'd start to be able to do bigger so it was a natural progression of going from small to big, and then I happened to see that you know, there was a local plein air event. I said, "Well, that ought to be fun," uh, and it was really humbling uh, to go out that first time and, and really fall. But uh, for some reason or another, uh, you know, the, the two pieces I put in sold and won won an award, which I think was kind of like, "Okay, maybe I don't stink as bad as I thought I did." And there, uh, I I would say that you know the figure drawing and, and painting uh, from life just evolved into plein air for me. That's right. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I grew up. I was the youngest of seven. I had five older sisters and older brother. And my brother is a he was an 
awesome drummer, killer singer. Um, he carves ice now for a living. He's got a big ice company, that's what he does. Uh, um, I ended up, I started playing guitar when I was 12 years old. I still play a little bit now, but I played seriously, religiously for many years, played in a lot of bands. Went to school for, uh, didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I grew up in a chaotic household, single mom, went to school, took a drawing class, wasn't really sure, then I took a print class with a guy, Malcolm Christel, who just like, I was like, I'm, I'm definitely doing this, I'm doing art. Uh, after I got out of school, I worked for about nine years in, in music biz, like I was excited, I learned how to build two amplifiers, and repair them, and repair a band, instruments, orchestral instruments, and guitar setups. Uh, and then I started uh, painting. I paint on the side. I would look at uh, T. Allen Lawson's website. If you guys know T. Allen Lawson, his, uh, that would be my art outlet. Looking at his paintings. And when I met him, he painted what he was doing that. Um, and so uh, somebody called me out of the blue from Pittsburgh. It was David Sean. He's a guy that's been done Easton a bunch of times. And he said, "We well, do this painting event." And I was like, "Yeah, what is it?" And uh, it was 2012, and I tried it. And it was a local Pittsburgh thing. And when I was there, everybody was talking about Easton. That's Easton. Easton. You go to Easton. It's like uh, I looked it up online, that was 2013. I said, Oh, this is just like a little Pittsburgh thing, it's just in Maryland. That was, like, oh, <laughs> that was a wrong thing. Then I got down and I just got my teeth kicked in, but in a good way. Uh, it, it changed my life, it changed my work ethic. I met guys like Tim Bell, Kelly Ward, uh, Steve Griffin, all these great things. I met you there that year. I met you were that little laundromat. Um, so that changed my outlook from then on. I've been doing, I've been doing these events, but I think I'm going to maybe pare down to these events a little bit. I, have, I already have been. Um, it's not that I, mean, I love doing this. I love the people. I love uh, the energy. Um, I just don't know if I'm very good at it right now. So I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I guess, just get better at working, like I said, and stuff like that. So. Uh, real quick, I want to say just a big thank you for everybody for being here. It's so cool to be a part of this, and I'm honored. These, everybody at this table is just wonderful artists, and to, and to have you all here and be interested in what we're doing, you don't know how much we appreciate this, because without you all, we couldn't do what we do, and it's, I think everybody would, would agree that this is important. So, um, I started painting when I was about 15. Uh, I went through all different phases, you know, like a lot of kids did, did the skateboarding thing, and I was in a band, I played guitar, and like I was going through all these different things, and baseball, and all this stuff, and then um, when I found painting, I remember telling my parents, I was like, I hope this is not one of those phases, because I really like this. <laughs> and, uh, so it was just, I made a bunch of terrible paintings. I was just going home, uh, coming home from school, and I told my parents, I said, I can't do my homework until after the sun goes down, because i got to go outside and paint. I had no idea what I was doing, I just knew I loved it. And um, I, I got out of high school and got my own place, and I was like, I needed to start making money, so I went and worked for a theater, painting um, backdrops and working with set, set designers and, and scenic artists. And it was cool because I got to incorporate art into what I was doing and, and get a paycheck. But it was like I painted for eight to ten hours a day, you know, 40, 60 hours a week. It was like the last thing I wanted to do when I got home was pick up a paintbrush. And so I said, okay, something has to change here because I was painting for other people and not paint for me. So um, it was about um, 23 or 24 years old. I um, quit my job at the theater, uh, met my wife, Jennifer, who's also an artist. And we were like, okay, we're going to do this thing. We're just going to dive head, head first into it and it's been really tough and we've made some sacrifices along the way um, but it's it's working out and it's it's in the process of working out that's why I'm sitting here and that's why I'm so appreciative to be part of this because it's, it's happening. So. Um, I grew up with a dad who was a graphic designer but I guess back in the day they were called commercial artists. Um, but he, he also painted on the side and he did like big culture-esque installations and so he, he was just I used to call him the Renaissance man. He just dabbled in everything. And so I went to art school. Um, you know, I was always the kid that drew in class and stuff. So I went to art school and I became a graphic designer. And, and flash forward 30 years, you know, I raised two kids, had my own graphic business, didn't draw, didn't paint, didn't, you know, I knew in the back of my head I could, I thought. And then um, my partner who I'm with now, one, like in 2011, bought me an easel and paints or maybe it was 2010. Anyway, they sat in the basement for like a year, and, and then I finally took a class, and that first, you know, pair that I painted, you know, and I was like, oh my God. So I just, whatever, I took it back, I've just been painting like crazy, and, and, but I didn't know what plein air was, and we, we retired from the Northern Virginia area in 2011, and moved to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and I met a friend of mine, um, and she talked about, you know, join my plein air group, and I'm like, okay, and, 
And and uh, actually, like a week later, they had their it was camp hill. It was a small little plenary event. And all the juried artists were already there, but they had the quick draw. And, and I was on all of the juried artists. And so I went to quick draw, and I won second place. Cool. So then I was like, Patrick, I said, what? I said, well, this is really cool. And so they told me the ones to apply to. And I got into Easton the next year, which is like crazy. And um, so I just never looked back. And now I do like 12, 13 of them a year. And we're like carnies. We travel around. <laughs> 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 And um, I, if someone had told me 10 years ago, you know, when I'm web designing and stuff, that this is what I'd be doing, I, I would have thought they were great. You know? But I love it, and, uh, you know, both my parents are, God bless them, are not with us, and I'm sure my dad would be looking down really, uh, he didn't have a clue how to do this. So this is really, really cool. I, as a kid, always wanted to be an artist. I went to art school and um, got out of art school, I was 22, and I really still didn't know what I was going to do, if I was going to be an artist or not. And then I went to this postgraduate course, Cypress College of Art, with all these English students that I had met when I was in state student, which is where I met the old English painter, Tom Watt, who uh, taught me about plein air painting. And when I came home from that, I had that side and that's what I'm going to do, and I did. And I basically worked every part-time job you can imagine since 1988 and um, finally 10 years ago I was actually quit everything and just paint. But I was painting plein air all along just in Richmond and most of my friends were abstract painters, professors at VCU and they always kind of looked at me as quaint and I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know any other plein air painters. And then luckily I started showing with Barbara about 10 years ago and I guess six years ago she goes, hey I'm going to do this plein air festival, you want to come? I'm like, yeah. And it was amazing for me to meet all these people that are all over the country. Painting. You know? <laughs> 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 so I, 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 I really enjoyed it and I really love I don't do many of festivals because my kids are still so young. Um, but it's great to know that they're out there. And uh, I love to paint. And so it's, it's been wonderful. Well, I, think, I think you can hear that uh, uh, everybody has kind of the same story. We all start going in the second grade. The artists in the classroom. But, uh, and you know, one of the challenges, and I did the same thing, and, and, and then of course I was going to go be a biologist, you know, everybody got to get a real job. My dad was a pharmacist, and, and they, my folks were very supportive, but you know, it's, it's but you got to get a real job. <laughs> so um, I was going to be a biologist, and then, uh, then I finally, you know, I said, you know, I think I want to paint. And uh, I was able to go to the university after I started college, kind of small start. Got through that, and then I thought, now what? So um, I got a job as a photographer, just to get a job. Uh, and, uh, and I didn't end up doing that for 30 years. But, but at least, and, and I think all of us kind of have the same story. We, we, you know, we, if we couldn't be a painter to begin with, we at least were in the arts. You know, we were trying to find some sort of uh, And I think one of the challenges that, that I always had is, uh, we had a guy come in, a guy named Tony Sherman, he's over in Canada. He, 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 I know what he was talking about. He said, he said, okay, you're here. We, we are in a critique. He said, you're here. So you must be a painter. If you decide to be a painter, you're a painter. And if you haven't decided to be a painter, then you're not a painter. So you are, either are or you aren't. And, and, and I found that really interesting because I think that the fact that we're doing this, it's not, it's not a sideline. It's, it's, and it's not even a job. It's not like we can go to it, we can turn it off, and we go home. We, we, we think it for 24 hours a day. And, and uh, one of the upsides is we're always on business. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, so it, it, it's a it's a lifestyle, it's a, it's, a, it's a philosophy, it's all this kind of stuff. So, but once you decide to do it and really commit yourself, uh, then you can you really you can get some, make some headway. And and the other thing too is you can't do this part time. Uh, there was a time when my kids were growing up and I wanted to paint, and, and uh, uh, my wife at the time she said, "Well, you can paint on Sunday, a Saturday. You, know, mm -hmm. and you can't. You, know, you can, but it, if you really want to make headway, so you want to be in this echelon." You have to you have to commit completely, and even then you may fail. That's why God made Scott. Are you sure it was God? That's the only way you're going to make it. The only way you can make it at this is to give it, you know, 100%. And even then, like I said, you know, we're, I'm 
many of us are getting, well, Neil is, but none of the rest of us are getting rich. <laughs> <laughs> so we're kicking it down the road, and we get it every day, and we, we think, like, you know, we can do it again. Even though we failed yesterday, maybe we can do it again. Maybe I can do it again. So that, that's, that's the fun thing. I, I'll make one quick point. Uh, so after college, I had a portfolio. I said, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm going to go to a gallery, see they're representing. So I walk in, put my stuff down. What do you think of that? Yeah, I ran to look at it for five seconds and said, come back in about eight years. <laughs> so, I have a tough skin in this business. Yeah. I'm going to wrap this whole thing with an explanation as to why there are poets and composers and artists and musicians. Abraham Maslow, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he uh, developed this thing called the hierarchy of need. And at the base of the pyramid of needs are the basic needs, water and and shelter. <clears throat> the pinnacle need is something called self-actualization, which, as it's defined, is the realization of one's greatest potential. It's defined as a need. So all these obsessive creative types who are after this elusive thing are honing their greatest potential, and none of us ever get there, is the pitch of it. <laughs> it's always just past your fingertips. So that's why we do what we do. And um, anyway, that was it. So <laughs>